Well, as your report said, Brexit is still the default position. It's in the European Union law and, of course, British law that we leave on the 29th of March at 11 p.m., just 16 days away. Then we're out. But it wouldn't be... There's no such thing as a no-deal Brexit. In the case of the withdrawal agreement not being passed, the European Union and the UK will implement other measures to keep trade open and to keep economic links. So, this, so really, there is actually no such thing as a cliff edge and nothing to fear from leaving the European Union. And last night's vote saying we should not leave uh, without uh, a specific withdrawal agreement is non-binding. It actually has that no legal effect. The only thing... That withdrawal agreement is what most people would call a deal. So, so leaving the European Union without that in place is effective. It doesn't matter whether you call it a withdrawal agreement or a deal. Uh, the, it amounts to the same thing. You are leaving without a deal, which brings with it a host uh, of uh, other uh, problems, uh, which we've already uh, talked about. For you, would you rather, at this stage, where we find ourselves now, would you rather that the UK leaves without a deal on the 29th of March, or without a withdrawal agreement in place, uh, or would you rather see an extension, however long or short, to the Article 50 process to try to renegotiate a different deal? Well, an extension becomes pointless. There is very little room for manoeuvre from the European Union. They've been refusing to budge on controversial issues surrounding the withdrawal agreement, particularly the backstop, which would ultimately separate, to some degree, Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom. There would be little purpose served by extending Article 50 negotiations. And if it goes on too long, Britain would have to partake in the European Union elections, send MEPs to the European Parliament. That is something we do not want to do in the UK and something the European Union doesn't actually well, let's, want. Well, let's put that to uh, Philip uh, Lambert. Is that, do you agree with, uh, with Mr Alds there that that is exactly what the EU wants to avoid? The UK still being in Europe when it comes to May's European parliamentary elections? Well, this is a situation that we'd rather not have uh, if indeed the end result is for the UK to leave the European Union. Now, that is still undecided. I agree with Mr. Olds that uh, what happens by default uh, 15 days from now is a no-deal Brexit. Now, I was a bit amused by uh, the statement that there, there is no cliff edge. You know, there, there, there are still people today claiming that the earth is flat. Uh, well, Everyone knows that it is, uh, it is not. And so you can assert things, you do not make them reality. The fact is that if the United Kingdom leaves without a deal, 15 days from now, there will be a cliff edge and a rendezvous in, uh, in 15 days and we'll see uh, uh, what that uh, does look like. Now, it's true. Mr. Olds, I see you shaking no your head here. I just, want to bring, I just want to bring Mr. Olds back in there on that. Just do respond there to, to Mr. Lambert's point. The European Union have confirmed that if we leave without the withdrawal agreement, what you call the deal, flights would continue. There would be unlimited access for hauliers. They've signed the transport convention so that customs declarations only need to be made at the final point of entry. The ports of Calais and Boulogne have confirmed that they will be fine to keep trade open. There will be equivalents in financial services. Everything will continue more or less the same. As, what uh, about what about known. Mr. Olds? What well, about some leaked some research some carried out carried out by the UK's own Brexit department that says uh, that overnight, uh, if we if we left without if the UK left without a uh, deal that, uh, on customs deals on customs on trades, parts of Britain would run out of food and medical supplies within uh, a fortnight. I just want to put this over back to Mr. to Mr. Lamberts here. How bad? Because we we hear varying different uh, versions of how bad a no deal Brexit would be for the British side of things. How bad would it be for the EU? How determined is the EU to avoid a no-deal Brexit? Well, uh, let me say this. A no-deal Brexit will have damaging effects on the United Kingdom and on the European uh, Union, 27 remaining member states. There's no doubt about that. Can someone uh, uh, put a figure on these, uh, on, on these damages? No. Are we fully prepared for that? No, but again, this is a risk that we are prepared to take because the alternative that the hard Brexiteers would like us to accept would be basically opening a 500 kilometers door into the single market that would be completely unpoliced, uncontrolled, which would spell the end of the single market. And the damage caused by that would be at least an order of magnitude bigger. And that is not what we are going to do. So if there is to be a no deal Brexit, 
there will be a no-deal Brexit. Will it be damaging? Absolutely. But we will preserve the union's main interest. And believe me, the integrity of the single market is not just a pillar of the European Union. It's one of its foundations. Although, Mr. Labbert, it is, it, it is difficult to understand why these fears uh, should be founded if you cannot be more precise about what those fears of a no-deal uh, Brexit are. So I go back uh, uh, to you, uh, Mr. Uh, Alls. If you see it that now, as far as you're concerned, the best way forward uh, for the UK is a sort of managed uh, no deal. What does that look like? Is it managed no deal? Is it, as some say, a crash out? You don't call it a crash out. But how do you see this process going on the 29th or whenever the date is? Well, yesterday, the British government published its uh, trade schedules and that included uh, procedures for trade between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, where trade would be conducted by making declarations via VAT. It's all all pretty much well organised already. The European Union and the UK are signed up to international measures to keep trade open. Most of our trade is actually now with the rest of the world. We do not need to be part of the political union and we do not need to be paying the European Union £39 billion, which is not liable, which we would be asked to pay under the withdrawal agreement. As I mentioned earlier, there is no fear about running, Britain running out of medicines. No uh, pharmaceutical company is warning uh, their, their customers that they will not be able to supply people. This is just... This is just arguments to try and keep us in the European Union. It's just project fear Although, again. And we've had enough your, of this now. On your, on your £39 billion pound divorce settlement, the only plan that's been put forward by the, uh, the hardline Brexiteers, by the ERG group, by Jacob Rees-Mogg, still involves handing over £20 billion pounds, uh, to uh, the UK. Look, I want to put a, a question to Mr Lamberts here. Do you think a lot of this, this last minute chaos that we're seeing on the UK side of things could have been avoided if the EU side had given a little bit more ground during the negotiations, had perhaps been willing to concede on some of Theresa May's uh, famously uh, so-called red lines, perhaps allowing Britain, for example, to have an independent trade uh, policy? Well, this is a song that I've heard dozens and dozens and dozens of times, that the EU has been unnecessarily unflexible with the UK. But what people fail to realise is that the Red lines of the British government are incompatible with one another. You cannot say at the same time we are exiting the single market and the customs union, A. B, we want to keep a total alignment between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. And C, we want to respect the Good Friday Agreement. These three red lines are incompatible with one another, period. And no amount of flexibility on the EU side can change this incompatibility. Of course, the hard Brexiteers, like probably Mr. Ulls, would like the European Union either to surrender the single market by opening a gigantic back door into it, or to have maybe Ireland following Uh, the UK into exiting the European Union, which would also solve the problems. But this would, of course, be ludicrous. Uh, There's no question that we are going to to surrender this, this kind of essential. So what you call a tiny bit of flexibility is actually massive concessions that would touch the very nature of the European Union. And the answer is no way. And this is not a matter of tiny flexibility. Basically, what the, uh, the hard Brexiteers want is not only to leave the European Union, but to damage it in a way that is irremediable. And this is not what we are going to do. So sorry about your, your language about the tiny flexibility. The problem is that the, the hands of the UK government, whatever that government's colour is, are bound by the Good Friday Agreement. This is an international treaty that the UK voluntarily uh, signed 20 years ago, and it's for the UK to abide by it, not to the European Union. Sorry, we have been reminded time and over by by, uh, the hard Brexit is that the EU is no part to the Good Friday Agreement. We are not. It's for the UK to, uh, to abide by it.